welcome in the presence of the Lord today as we open up his word of truth. And I pray that you will receive this word so that you can walk in freedom, in life, in abundance, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. My sermon today is about covenant membership. The word covenant appears for the first time in Genesis 6, 18, where God says to Noah, I will establish my covenant with you. It occurs another 270 times throughout the Old Testament. In addition to being used to refer to covenants established by God with man, it is also used to refer to covenants made by men with one another. Genesis 21, 27 talks about marriages to friendships in 1 Samuel 18, 13, to vows in Ezra 10, 3, and to commitments in 2 Kings 11, 4. I hope that you wrote those scriptures down to go check them out. That could be your devotions for the next few days. Hallelujah. And the word is defined as a pact, an agreement, an obligation, a mutual commitment, and a solemn promise made binding by an oath. Do you remember a few weeks ago I spoke about Shabbat, the word that I kept repeating in tongues? So I researched it and it meant solemn oath. Well, here it is again. As I was preparing for this message, covenant membership, and I research the word covenant, again we see that word solemn oath. Hallelujah. I believe God is trying to tell us something. There is something here that God wants us to receive, to walk into. And I pray that today you will begin, if you're not already, to walk into his benefits, his promises that are yes and amen. Part of what we received in this covenant is the gift of tongues. And I cannot share enough about how important the gift of tongues is to us today at, at this moment in time in history. The word says to earnestly desire spiritual gifts. Do you want more today? Do you want more of him in your life? Do you want to walk in more signs, wonders, and miracles today? Listen to this word. I believe that God is causing us to hear these messages for a divine purpose. Hallelujah. So the Holy Spirit, we know he's a counselor He's a lawyer, our advocate. He's our strengthener. He's our helper. The anointing is a person. The Holy Spirit is the anointing to heal. Amen? And when we speak in tongues, the Holy Spirit is praying through us according to God's perfect will. So why don't we pray in tongues more? We need to make it a habit, a continual habit every day, every morning when we get up, when you pray, begin by speaking in tongues. Hallelujah. Now, one of our pastors name is Craig Broker, and he said, in a sense, the Holy Spirit is praying things out of us and removing problems. Hallelujah. We can pray into the future and change things. Oh, hallelujah. We need to pray in tongues every day. Come on, guys. Amen. Praying in tongues, according to Jude 20, builds our faith. And in Romans 8.26, it says, Whoever prays in tongues edifies himself. The word edify means builds himself up, helps himself grow, receives strength, 
advances his own spiritual progress. Oh, it's like a battery that's dying in a car. You turn the ignition and all you hear is brr, 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 especially in the winter. And so you need to boost your battery to get it started. Well, in the same way, the Holy Spirit boosts us. He boosts us to get us started in ministry, hallelujah, in what God wants us to do, to walk in power. Thank you, Jesus. You're getting your inner man charged up and it increases my spirit for more. Brother Kenneth Hagen said this, your spirit man grows just the same as your body and your mind does if you exercise it. So exercising our spiritual man by praying in tongues. When I pray in the spirit, I keep myself aligned with what God's love and will has planned for me. I can experience the blessings of God. I am posturing myself to receive. Your spirit will alert you. And in this last day, we need to be alerted by the spirit to know how to pray, what to pray. And praying in tongues will do just that. We are praying God's perfect will. Hallelujah. And we need to be alerted in the spirit that something is going on and that we have the wisdom to pray and declare in Jesus name. Amen. It also develops your spirit to know what to do with the gifts of the spirit when revival comes. And I believe revival has begun in many, many places. Do you want to be revived today? Yes, I want to be revived. Is that your heart's prayer today? I hope it is. Now let's go read in Isaiah 61. Let's start with one to three. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. I pray that you will be lifted up if you have a spirit of heaviness, amen, like the word says here, that a garment of praise would come upon you as you worship God, hallelujah, even as a sacrifice of praise, if you're going through something and you don't feel like worshiping, worship him because God will, and it says it here, hallelujah, he will give you an oil of joy for mourning. He will give you a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness so that you may be called trees of righteousness. Hallelujah. So here in verse one, because the Lord has anointed me, the ministry of God's anointed as a healer and messenger of freedom and comfort is the ministry of Christ. Hallelujah. He is the anointed one. Thank you, Jesus. Now let's look at the covenant blessings in verses 8 to 11. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery for burnt offering. I will direct their work in truth. And I will make with them an everlasting covenant. That speaks of covenant membership. Their descendants shall be known among the Gentiles and their offspring among the people. 
all who see them shall acknowledge them that they are the posterity whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels, for as the earth brings forth its bud, as the garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. And I believe that we will see this great revival all over the world before the Lord comes in the rapture. Amen. It's so soon, guys. It can be any time. It could be any second, any moment. So God's promise to give justice, righteousness, and salvation upon his people, transforming their sorrow into joy and clothing them with his glory and blessings. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Having shared this good news from the word, Let's see what can hinder us from walking into the blessings of God. Colossians 2, 8. Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the powers of this world rather than from Christ. There's a lot of that going on today. We don't know what to believe when we see something on the news, right? And these empty philosophies and high sounding nonsense that come from human thinking has seeped into our mind when it comes to things like healing, prosperity, sin, sickness. Let me explain. Do you realize that Jesus's ministry Two-thirds of his ministry was done healing people, delivering, setting the captives free. So does that mean that Jesus heals today? Well, some people don't believe that, that Jesus heals supernaturally today. So then the church has backed off, has believed the lie, and they wrap it in religious talk pretty much empty philosophies and say things like, if it's God's will, I'll be healed. The Lord wants us to know his will. Luke four seventeen to 19, Jesus says this, and he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Preach, heal, deliver, comfort, rebuild, and serve. The ministry of Jesus described here is also the ministry of his church moving in the power of the Holy Spirit. Say, it's also my ministry. Come on. It's also my ministry. God doesn't call you to produce more. He's calling you to believe for more. For greater works he has in store for us to receive and by his grace achieve for his kingdom purposes and glory. Ask, seek, and knock. Keep your heart set and ready for the next advance for his kingdom. Only the truth of God's grace and power has the anointing to liberate and set people free. Let me say it again. Only the truth of God's grace and power 
has the anointing to liberate and set people free. This week we studied Romans 5, and I'd like to read you a couple of verses in verse 17 and 20. I'm reading from the Passion Bible. Death once held us in its grip, and by the blunder of one man, which is Adam, death reigned as king over humanity. But now how much more are we held in the grip of grace and continue reigning as kings in life, enjoying our regal freedom through the gift of perfect righteousness in the one and only Jesus the Messiah. And in verse 20, so then the law was introduced into God's plan to bring the reality of human sinfulness out of hiding. And yet, wherever sin increased, there was more than enough of God's grace to triumph all the more. And just as sin reign through death, so also this sin-conquering grace will reign as king through righteousness, imparting eternal life through Jesus, our Lord and Messiah. That was also verse 21. Are you assured of eternal life? Because here it tells us that God's righteousness, his perfect righteousness is placed on us who believe in the Son of God. So I'll take a moment right now. If you are listening and you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, pray this prayer with me. Father God, I believe in your Son. I thank you for sending him to the earth to die for my sin. Forgive me, Lord, of my sin of unbelief. I ask you to come into my life and make me whole in Jesus' name. If you've prayed a prayer like this or similar to this from your heart, you are saved. And now everything I'm saying concerning these covenant promises from our membership in Christ that is eternal belongs to you. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Say we have a new membership. We had a membership of death, but now covenant membership of super abundant grace is ours as we continue to reign as kings in life. Hallelujah. In verse 20, Paul adds the prefix Hooper, H-U-P-E-R, which means hyper. So you could say it like this, super hyper abundant grace. It comes down to this. There is an endless fountain of grace that has been open for us in Christ. So the devil's plan is this. Isn't that good when we know the strategic plan of the enemy? Because the Spirit of God reveals it to us. Amen. So number one, if he can keep people away from the good news of Jesus Christ, his plan is working. Number two, one save, and if he keeps people from understanding their riches in Christ, his plan is working. You see? And the enemy has been using these fences to prevent believers from having access to these powerful truths of God. He built fences of controversy around healing, prosperity, and grace to keep believers from reigning over sickness, poverty, and sin. Sin is punishment, and it's part of the curse. God never created sickness. He created life and abundant at that. Sickness is a perversion through the fall of man. Another fence the enemy puts up is towards prosperity. Is money evil? 1 Timothy 6 10 says, the love of money is the root of all evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. So money itself is neutral. And what you do with it, if you share it, if you bless, if you give to God's kingdom, hallelujah, then it is used for good. 
Why would believers fight for the right to stay sick and poor? Why do we take our children to the doctor when they're sick? Because we want them to feel better from whatever ails them. Why do we give our children the best education we can afford? Isn't it because we want our children to be blessed and get a good job so that they can go in life and be blessed? Amen? Now, do you think that our Heavenly Father would want anything less for you? Many ask the question, is tithing for today? Well, let me share a few scriptures that shows that Jesus endorses tithing. First of all, it's even more than that. In Luke eleven forty two, it says, But woe to you, Pharisees! For you tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs and pass by the justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. So they're giving their tithe out of law, out of obligation, but they're not showing justice. They're not showing love to their fellow man. And that's what Jesus rebukes them about. So he tells them, these you ought to have done the tithing without leaving the others undone. Love, justice, mercy, compassion, right? God gave us his most cherished son. Jesus gave up his kingship in heaven and abased himself to humanity. He became a man depending on the Holy Spirit, just like us. He gave his life for our sins so that we can have a covenant relationship with our Father. And now we are accepted by God, not a God who is far away and we don't know what he's thinking or what he's doing or how he's judging. No, the mystery has been revealed in Jesus. There is no more I don't know how God is. I don't know what God will do. There's none of that. We can know the will of God because Jesus came to this earth to show us what the will of the Father is. Because of all of this giving that the Lord has done, let's read 2 Corinthians 9, 6 to 10. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one gives as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. As it is written, he has dispersed abroad, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Hallelujah. Here are the key ideas of the principle of giving. God owns everything and his people are money managers. Christians, we are called to more extravagant free will giving in response to the gospel of the Lord Jesus based on faith in God as provider. So it should be more than 10%. Do you hear what I'm saying? In the New Testament, because of the freedom that we have in Christ, because we have been set free from our sin, and we have covenant membership with our God, all things are possible. <laughs> all things are possible. So let us be people who believe in his covenant promises, the membership that we have with him and understand that as we give, he will give even more. Come on. He says here, and God is able to make 
all grace abound toward you, that you having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. I hope that this has convinced you that we are to be generous givers in the New Testament because of what Jesus did for us. He did it all. Therefore, he owns it all. Amen? Say we are free. <laughs> in Matthew 10, verse 8, Jesus instructs his disciples and says, Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, and drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Therefore, live in divine health, what belongs to you, and pray for those who are sick. This happened at Costco yesterday. I went looking for a bathroom vanity and I asked this lady in the department if she could help me. She said, I will in one minute. I am having heart palpitations and I need to get some water. Immediately I said, can I pray for you? And she looked at me hesitantly and I said, it's up to you but I believe in the power of prayer. And she looked and said, okay. And so I placed my hand gently on her shoulder and I prayed for healing and those heart palpitations to stop. It's easy to minister to people when you know that God heals. You've seen miracles, signs and wonders, and you know that he loves people and he wants to show himself through us. Just like he said to his disciples, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons freely. You have received freely give. <laughs> Praise God. So when she came back, she said, when this happens, I panic. I have to learn to stop panicking. So praying for her opened up a conversation between her and I. So I speak peace to Havana's heart and mind right now in Jesus' name. And anyone else who needs peace in the midst of a crisis, in the midst of a trouble that you're going through, I speak peace to you in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. May the Prince of Peace rule your heart. You see, Jesus is the only answer. He is the way, the truth, and the life. There is all kinds of truths, false truths, that are being said right now everywhere in this world. But we know that Jesus is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. Amen? Come on, let's decree it right now. Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus. He says, except through me. He's talking about himself. Hallelujah. So how do we receive divine health and walk in the blessings that God provides? By faith we receive. Amen. We receive it and we declare it with our mouth. The spirit of God is living in you. Say, I've got God's Spirit living in me. I've got God's Spirit living in me. He sealed you with a promise by His Spirit. You see, Jesus was punished with the curse. 39 lashes on His back. He was whipped and scourged. He was beaten. And by those stripes, Isaiah saw it and so did Peter. By his stripes, you are made whole today. Now, in order to receive these promises that God has for us, these blessings, this membership that we have with all the benefits of God to reign as kings in life, we need to renew our mind. That's the key. That's the process we must go through to accept what is true in the word of God. You see, we're under influence of so many lies. Good people say God doesn't heal everybody. That's like saying God doesn't save everybody. 
Not everyone gets saved, nor does everyone get healed. Nonetheless, God is always willing to save and to heal those who are lost. Amen? Psalm 103, 2 to 4 assures us of this. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins. And is this it? No. And heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Before you accepted Christ, your life may have gone from one trouble after another without his help. But now that you are a Christian, that you are saved, you are crowned with love and compassion. And that helps you to go through everything in life, knowing that he is there with you. That is so comforting. The little word and here is used to connect words of the same part of speech, clauses or sentences that are to be taken jointly. So you can't separate who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. We're to see them jointly. That is the word of God. It's not salvation only. It includes every form of healing, spiritual, emotional, and physical. And redeeming our lives from the pit, whatever trouble, struggle, abuse that comes from the pit of hell, you are delivered from. He heals the brokenhearted and crowns you with love and compassion. If you've been brokenhearted by the things you've gone through, receive the cascade of love that comes from his love. It's an unending fountain that fills you and washes out of you all of the struggles, all of the stuff that you've gone through. I pray that you and even me, that we receive this revelation of love, of the cascade of love that comes upon us. So instead of saying, if it's your will, heal my body, because that really means that we don't know his will. And it's a common prayer that people pray today that may seem like it's prayed in humility, but really it's prayed in unbelief. And unbelief is sin, right? True humility is surrendering to the will of God. That's what Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane in Matthew 26. He said, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Jesus knew what the will of God was for him to go to the cross and take the sin of the world on his shoulders. He knew the will of God and he surrendered to it. Wonderful Lord, powerful Jesus, who died on the cross for me, for my sins. Hebrews eleven six says, And without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Hallelujah! We are rewarded when we earnestly seek him and his word and see what his word says. Ask, seek, and knock. Say this with me. This is the word of truth. I believe everything that is in here, regardless of my feelings or circumstances. His word is truth. Amen. So we must read the word of God to know his will. Healing is mentioned many, many, many times in the Bible. Everywhere Jesus went, he healed. He set the captives free. He delivered. That was a part of his ministry. One of God's names in Exodus 15, 26 is the Lord who heals which is one of his name that he reveals himself to the people, Jehovah Rapha. 
And so, therefore, it is God's nature to heal. Healing is not just something God does. It is who he is. We need to overflow in his anointing so that we can walk in divine health. I once painted three bowls and one was this way. So a little bit was falling out. The other one was more this way and more was falling out. And then the other bowl was this way. Amen. Overflowing. Do you want to overflow from his presence? Amen. We need to spend that time. Pray in tongues. Read the word. Believe and decree what the word says. Know his will. According to your faith, let it be done. With all of the lies that is going on out there that has seeped in through the church, we are going to learn to live from Isaiah 60, 1 to 4. Arise and shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. Darkness as black as night covers all the nations of the earth, but the glory of the Lord rises and appears over you. All nations will come to your light. Mighty kings will come to see your radiance. When we shine as we should, others that are in darkness will see your light where we can share the good news of salvation and covenant membership, all the promises that are ours in Jesus. Verse four says, look and see for everyone is coming home. Your sons are coming from distant lands. Your little daughters will be carried home. Are you believing for your sons and daughters to come home? Then shine, don't be distracted by their darkness and what they're walking in, but shine when you're in their presence. The light of the world has come and the light and glory of God is upon you. He is in us, with us, and for us. Where two or three are gathered in his name, he is in the midst of us. If God be for us, who can be against us? That's in Romans 8. We need to realize as well that common sense is not God's sense. Many times it's not. That's why Romans 12 tells us to renew our mind to the truth of his word. See, the devil doesn't want you to believe these truths because if you do, he's in trouble. He's the devil of curse, sickness, unbelief, and disaster. However, God is good all the time. He is the God of love, blessing, healing, and overcoming unstoppable faith. Yes, Jesus. We even call storms, tornadoes, and that kind of thing as acts of God. The devil says it's God's fault. So people believe that. And when trouble comes, they say things like, well, my mother was a good woman and she died, and if God allowed her to die, he is not a good God, so I am not serving him. But like I said before, God is always good, and we must know and be convinced of the will of God. So since we are here to rule and reign, let us confess, decree, bind spirits, and loose freedom in people's lives. And believe it for ourselves. So get in position by the truth of the word to receive from him. Hallelujah. To hear his directions. To know that we have been called to preach, to heal, to deliver as we have freely been given. Thank you, Jesus. Father, thank you for your word. Bless your word, O oh God, that is truth, that is mighty to save, O oh God. 
and Lord mighty to heal Lord Jesus as you say oh God that you heal all our diseases thank you Jesus you save us Lord from our sins so you save us and you restore us you heal us and you fill us and you enable us to walk in this life by the power of your spirit to do your will in this earth when people don't know your will we know your will the mystery of god has been revealed through christ so walk in faith walk in truth and walk in the will of god that you know from reading this word in jesus name amen be blessed and be a blessing